Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Joseph Owen, and that's my, all my Spanish for this presentation. <laughs> so I know that there's someone hiding who's translating, so I will try to speak a little slower. I will. So um, go ahead. Thank you. I've been in the game business for 25 years, a little more than that. So uh, I started out as a copywriter at an ad agency and had a brother who dropped out of a university to go program with this guy by the name of Steve Wozniak. And he brought home an Apple II computer and I'm watching my little brother program and I'm going, if he can do this, so can I. So I taught myself how to code. And the first thing I started to do was to make games, really bad, ugly card games. But what it did in my career was it gave me this whole different perspective as to what you can do with games, what you can do with computers, and how you can engage people. And so from that, my whole career changed. And instead of writing ads for the rest of my life, I did a variety of things and a variety of games and ultimately got to uh, in touch with my feminine side. <laughs> and ran the Barbie business for two years globally at uh, Ogilvy and & Mather. And um, I think it was one of the more challenging but interesting experiences. Uh, they wanted to go digital, they did. And only Mattel can spend all the money and get nothing for it. It's an interesting thing. So I thought that since everyone else at Conference 3.0 has been discussing the creative side of the business, I wanted to approach it from the more practical side because I realize that many of you are students, some are young professionals. How many are students in the room? Okay. How many are working at game studios now? Okay. So my feeling is that for anyone who wants to make games, you have to understand one thing. It's a business. So I want to start out with why is this a good business for you to be in? Why should you spend your money learning how to code or do things? And the reason being is because this is a really great slide that's really out of focus, is that there's about $12 billion a year spent in monetization in mobile games globally across all formats, free to play games. So there's plenty of opportunity the challenge is how it breaks down and the types of items. And I will make this deck available to uh, people who send me an email afterwards. Go ahead. And I'll see if the other one is any better. Yeah. So what's changed about games is that if you look at this slide over here, the US and Europe, you know, you always see the rest of the world, Electronic Arts, Disney, Ubisoft, the same companies who have been very successful in making games have, are the leaders, except in Asia. And Asia is where our future is really being shaped because what's happening in Asia is informing and influencing what's going on in the rest of the world. And all the leaders for the last 25 years, they're not doing diddly in the rest of the world in Asia. So there's a good lesson to be learned there. So everyone thinks that free to play and, and social games are just the hottest, biggest thing. And when you think about it, this one little thing that brings it all home to me is that you're still dealing with less than about 40% of the population of people who say they play games. That means you've played a game once in the last seven days. And a game can be Angry Birds, it can be Solitaire. Doesn't matter. If you say you play a game, you're a game player, according to the researchers. 38%. So that means two thirds of the population are not playing games, free to play games. So there's some opportunity. Thank you. So why does this matter? Again, games are a business. If you want to make games, you're going to need to learn the rules of the game of business. So that's what I'm going to try and take us through very quickly. So as a uh, Alejandro mentioned I teach at USC and one of the courses I take teaches is game production and studio management. And a lot of the things that I cover here, I cover in weeks, not 20 minutes. So any of this look familiar? 
This was my nightmare for so many years in publishing. How does anyone find my game? You can ask the same question today. It's worse. It's worse. And so there's lots of ways to combat that. Uh, as everyone has talked about Angry Birds, I will too. Rovio, I have good friends there. Rovio had to borrow money to finish that game. They were bankrupt. It was their 50th game. That's true. F 50 iterations. It's a lot. That's a lot. I don't think anyone here, for the most part, as a young studio, has built 50 games or published 50 games. And their expectations were not to be a billion dollar company with Angry Birds. But so many things clicked. And so they're an outlier. In fact, for the most part, the companies that are the most successful in free to play and mobile gaming are the exception, not the rule. And so what I try to instill in my students and studios that I work with is that there's ways to take control of things to where at least you can uh, have a good at bat in baseball terms so that you have a, a chance to break even and have another game. Because the whole thing is you want to continue to make more games. For all of you, the more games that you make, the better you will be. In the same way that you practice a, a piece on the piano, the more you play it, the better you'll be. This is the old way of making games, or this is where Nintendo got the Wii. <laughs> so in reality, when I started making games, this was the very simple formula. You start off with some bags of dinero, you put a 12 people in a room, and then you get together and you spend six months working, and then you ship this. And you're done. It's in the stores. It's in KB. It's in GameStop. It's everywhere. And so what happens is, you know, the traditional model was that you bring everyone together, ship it, and you shrink it, and you're done. So your studio size can drop down, or hopefully you've lined up two or three more gigs so that everyone who was working on the last product can immediately start to work on the next. And when there were 300 or more games a year, console games being commissioned by publishers, people could do that. That doesn't work. So this was the typical model. Go ahead. So this is the real big difference. So I used to drive in my own slides. Free to play turns everything on its side. Because your studio, if you're going into free to play, should be and after you publish, that's when you add your staff and you scale. Why? Because you're not going to have the revenue to be able to do it. And more young studios fail by having too much staff trying to do too large a game before they generate any revenue or any consumer exposure. So you have to rethink the way you structure your studio, you structure your pipeline, and how you bring the game out. So let's define free to play. Uh, it's not a business model per se. It's really all about design. Free to play games are designed. It's all about what you do. You don't take a game and then it's just decide every level you have to pay me. That's not free to play. It's a business model, but it's a business model that informs every aspect of the design of your game because you have to be thinking, what things will my audience want to do within the environment that I create that they will get enough value to where they'll want to pay me? And yeah, I can squeeze them a little bit to get them to pay a little more, but that's where the design starts. It doesn't necessarily start with a story, as David was talking about. It helps, but first and foremost, you have to think about how do I motivate people to spend? And the best examples of companies, interactive companies, that have figured out how to monetize are IGT. They're the largest manufacturer of slot machines in the world. And anyone here play slot machines? Casino? People will spend four hours standing in front of one machine 
they've obviously figured something out and these compulsion mechanics and the psychology of how they work is available. It's public knowledge. And there's a number of books I would I recommend that my students read to get some insight into that as they think about their design. So in my mind, there's basically five things that are important. There's 5,000 things that are really important, but there's five to start out with. And has anyone heard this phrase before, KPI? Key performance indicators? If you're uh, looking for outside investors to fund your business, this is one of the first things they're going to ask you about. So tell me about your KPIs. So let's define what they are. Basically, you want to know how much is it going to cost to get to your minimally viable product, your MVP. That's a game that's playable to the point where consumers can interact and they can transact and you can learn and then immediately push a new build of the game out based on what you see. How much is it going to cost you to go from servicing 500 people in a test to 10,000 people, to 20,000 concurrents, to 50,000? These are all questions that you should be asking yourselves before you start to code. Because once you commit human resources and your team, your studio, to build, you're spending money. Either your money out of your pocket, or if it's an investor's money, equity. Once you've spent that dollar, that peso, gone. It doesn't come back. You've sold a third of your company, and you've just spent it, and you haven't shipped anything. It's not good. So I want to help you prevent that. ECPA, the effective cost of your player acquisition. How much does it cost you to get someone to play your game? How long do they play? How many sessions? Will they play a month, two months, or they play a day and drop out? Do they get past the install screen? And for everyone, it's the in-app conversion ratio. So people who are playing your game, how many of them are actually transacting and paying you money? And the number that drives me crazy, but it's the number that all investors focus on, is ARPDAO, how much your, your average user is spending per day in your game. So this is what I think it takes to, to focus around building an MVP. You have a core team. You have to build quickly. It's, it's essential. Without it, you'll spend too much money, and you put yourself in a hole before you start. It's important that you do pre-launch testing. And testing is a good three hours of conversation in and of itself. But the ways to test are with friends immediately, family, and then small little markets. You can publish in the App Store, and you can publish in New Zealand, which has about this many players, and get feedback immediately and incorporate it and build it. If you're in an iOS or Android environment, if you're browser-based, you have even more flexibility. You need to immediately integrate the feedback. I have studios who basically are doing an updated build every week religiously and pushing with their browser-based games. Within the App Store, they try to build every three weeks only because of the annoyance. And their methodology is that there's always a new goodie to offset the tweaks that they've made based on monetization and optimiza optimization of their revenue. Oh my god, it's the rogue, the rogue slide. This will kill your studio. Everyone here who's built a game has been guilty of this. We become very fond of our ideas. We think we're special. Our team is really behind us. And I had this dream that if we added golden monkeys to the next three levels, we'll get more money. So we have to stop everything and implement this. This has is, this is killed Electronic Arts for three years running, where games that were scheduled to be built in 18 months took 36 months. It's because people keep saying, well, we need to add this. And what if we did this? Stop that. Your first build, your MVP, needs to be very contained and finite. It needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Stop. And then put everything else into the next iteration. 
And again, it should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But if you start thinking out like a television producer, a, a story bible, 13 episodes, I've written them all. This isn't TV. It costs too much money. Stop building. Ship. Again, integrate, repeat, integrate, repeat. Within your studios before you actually ship, you should be building every 48 hours. You should have something new to play. And if you don't, then you need to rethink what your production pipeline is so you can be. Especially if you're, most of you, I would assume, are using Unity or somebody's off-the-shelf technology, it makes it that much easier to build faster. This can be lethal. People, again, add more staff before they need them. You need to add staff after you've already needed them, not before. That's not a good way to plan because you don't have the, the resources. Electronic Arts can carry 3,000 extra people for 18 months and other than investors, no one cares because you never know. I may need to move people from team to team. As a startup, as a young company, you can't do that. How much does it cost you to buy a player? And you can pay two cents, you can pay $20. Depends on, I bet you didn't know that as a game player, you are a commodity. So for those of you who do play free to play games, the first and foremost thing you should know is once you've put in your Facebook number, your Facebook login, you've just sold yourself. You have just sold yourself for 500 coins and a level. I know I'm worth more, <laughs> and you should be too. This is the magic formula when you're looking at scaling your, your game idea. You need to know on some level that the amount of money that your player will spend over their lifetime value, the 30, 60, 90 days that you believe a player will stay, is more than how much it costs you to buy a player. So in anything else, if it costs you $10 to make something, but you're only getting $6 back, you need to change your formula. And this is the challenge. We've spent so much money as young studios building our games and not enough feedback to know how much we can make that when someone says, well, I can get you 25,000 players and it'll cost you $5,000 a week, and you need them for four weeks so you can have enough player mass to where all your numbers start to work and you realize, I'm upside down another $100,000. So it's important to do this. And again, what I stress is that all of these things are predictable and projectable before you begin to code. And it's one of the most important things about pre-production in free-to-play games. You need to have the business cycle as solid as you do your creative and your coding. The K factor. Has anyone heard of this term before? For those of you who have been doing this. So this is your influence factor. This is the, the theory that if I come in as a new player and I like your game, I'm going to tell my friends. I'm going to tell my family. I'm going to post to Facebook. I'm going to spam my 3,000 friends on Facebook asking them to give me an extra set of moves. Candy Crush. It works. There is, a, there is a K factor for every game, but it's hard to predict until you've actually sampled it a little bit. And you can model based on what some other people are doing, but don't go look at the K factor of Candy Crush and immediately apply it to your new game. That's not real. They're an outlier. If you're free to play and everyone is playing for free, something's broken. It's important to think about, again, design informs your business. Think about how you design, what players will do, and what natural tendencies they will have to enact to get money, to give you money. Of course, there's in-app advertising, which is not as valuable as it will be. It will continue to become more valuable. Players have less and less objection. But there's so many billions of advertising impressions that they're not a big revenue in terms of hard cash. But it's, it's still money. And more importantly, it's co-promotion. 
because as the first early slides, when you're a sea of a thousand new games a month in the App Store US, and actually it's closer to 2,000, uh, how do you get discovered? You get discovered by co-promotion, and co-promotion is advertising. And there are a number of servers that are very good at allowing independent uh, developers who are self-publishing to network with each other and trade impressions within their games. So all of a sudden, you have five million people that are seeing your game, as opposed to you going to Gree or somebody else and buying impressions on the open market for 50 cents. To me, ARPDAO is a general barometer. It doesn't tell you the health of everything. It gives you an idea as to what's going on. It will indicate some volatility. If you start seeing spikes, you know that there's updates that need to be timed differently or that people are reaching certain levels and certain levels are monetizing better. One of our early games, the chariot races, uh, as it really was quite brutal. M most people did not survive you know, more than a weekend. Again, they were slaves, so there was a little bit. And this is not too different from the environment that I think a lot of studios have to contend with today. It's a chariot race, and you have to, you have to be strong and prepared to win the race. So one of the examples and one of the exercises I do in class about mid-semester is everyone has to do a P&L for their studio based on a game. So again, these numbers are difficult to read on this screen and they'll be in the deck. But basically, I'm brilliant, so of course I have my brilliant game company, my brilliant game company, not me. And over the course of two years, I'm hoping to make, you know, not enough money to where I barely eke out a profit. So by year two, I'm gonna make $2 million. I know every expense that has to go into building this game. If you don't know how much it's going to cost you down to the cent, shame on you. I mean, you're wasting your own money. You need to know. So I build a business model. I look at the key performance indicators and use this to drive scenarios so that I can change things very quickly. And you know, the range is what's acceptable, is just that I really don't believe that there's more than a half a dozen people who see K factors of 4.0 and above. Your K factor is probably 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. There's influence, but until you've been successful, it's hard to get the scale. It's like a log, logarithmic scale. Each increment is 2x, 4x more than the previous. That's right. All of these things are the variables in terms of both looking at revenue and costs. The things that aren't variable are the number of human beings you're paying every month, other than the fact that you can remove them. And I'm not sure how it's structured here in Colombia, but in the States, most of the young studios that come out of that have been incubated, there's three to four core people, and then the other eight people that they bring in to start building, they're contractors. And our labor laws make that very easy. And it's not that they're not paid well, they're just, they have no benefits. They can be removed at will. And that's really, again, that's really important, especially in countries where when you have an employee, you tend to have an employee for a long time, and it's very difficult to be rid of them so if you have the flexibility in terms of how you structure your studios, you should take advantage of it. Do they? Um, yeah, something. You, but the thing is that it's not, you can, uh, like, teams here are so small that it's still just the core team. Okay. Okay. So taking these numbers, let's go to the first six months. Basically, I plug my numbers in and start asking myself, how much do I want to purchase? How much will it cost me? How much will it do? And how much revenue will I make just from the revenue line? And if you go to the next slide, 
Ooh, the wrong color. It's the wrong color overall, but when you first ship a game, your first 30 days, you're probably not going to have positive cash flow. So the question is, at what point can you get positive? And how long can you endure investing your cash to keep your studio going while your game either gets better, gets traction, or you decide to, to build another game that's a derivative of the first game that you shipped? So I always like to quote Homer. If something's hard to do, then it's not worth doing. And I think that must be the philosophy of a lot of young studios, because they, they all say they understand when their board gives them advice, when they bring in consultants, but then they don't do it. And you know why? Because it, it really is hard. It's hard to tell someone on your team that their idea isn't good enough to spend money on right now. And cooperatives, are really good literary devices. They're really good in sports, but even on your favorite sports team, there's a captain. And within a studio, someone has to be the boss. Someone has to be the one saying yes or no to the key decisions. And once the decision is made, you've got to, if, if your team isn't supporting you, then change the team member quickly because it will be a distraction. It will lead to ruin. You will waste a month arguing, well, it's not really what, I, I wanted to do it this way because I didn't like the way you were suggesting it. I really don't care. We made the decision, this is what's going to be. And these are high expectations from, from my perspective, looking at a lot of young professionals because you haven't had 100,000 hours of extra human interaction building games as I have, as many of my colleagues who are here. But it's something to be if you're the boss of your studio, your voice better be the loudest. It doesn't mean you don't listen to others, but it means you have to take responsibility for it, make the commitments, and act and execute quickly. The real Homer said it more eloquently. We've all seen worse than this. And as hard as it is to be successful, wildly successful, to be a Rovio, to be a King.com with Candy Crush, even the original, some of the Zynga games. There's plenty of studios that are out there around the world that are doing free to play, covering their cash flow, and being able to build another game. And if you take that approach, what does it take for me to build my next game by being good at this game? You'll be able to do that. So for me, it's about content. It's always about content. And Everyone else who's spoken at the conference, I think, has given you, hopefully, good ideas about story and dynamic and play mechanics and loops. And if not, there's many resources here at the conference as well as online to where you can get some hard knowledge. But it's also really about the business. Your first game as a game maker in a studio that you've started is the game of how do I stay alive? And it's a resource management game in real time. And you don't have enough resources, and respawns are much slower. So by knowing all your targets and knowing all your performance, you can control chance. And ultimately, that's what this is all about. All the things that you do in pre-production, the way you closely manage building your MVP and getting audience feedback, player feedback daily and incorporating it, you get to be in control. Otherwise, if you're not in control, you don't know where you're going to go. I wish you all good luck with your games. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any questions if there's time. If not, I'm here through Friday. Thank you very much. Tenemos tiempo para un par de preguntitas. Preguntas. No questions. Has Sean is Sean Sean Copeland. I've tied you. Oh, one question. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things uh, when you try to make a balance um, is how you project your income, because as we said yesterday, uh, well, you don't want to uh, fantasize and just say, well, I'm going to sell ten thousand units per per month. 
So, but you get that both. I just expect to do so. So your balance might be just a fantasy board if you don't do it right. Mm -hmm. Because your expenses, you 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 can know exactly. What, well, at least it's very sure, very close to reality. How many people? How many computers? What's your rent? And so on and so on. But with your income, it's not so easy, especially with your. Uh, talking about a free play, um, free play game. So, what would be your advice? Your advice to make a better projections about those incomes or sales. So, there's there's three things. I build games using starting out the old-fashioned way. I use boards, paper, paper prototypes. I make my teams build paper prototypes, and I make the team play them, and I videotape them, and I watch. And if people aren't smiling, you know, you have to fix it. And once you have a playable, you can get a very quick read within 48 to 72 hours as to whether people are enjoying enough of the game based on the where they're going and how much time they're spending. And when you go, when I do a 24-hour test, and I do 10,000, do a test of 10,000, I get 2,000 installs out of the 10,000 invites that I send out, and these are all free, and I get 1,000 people the next day asking for another code, that's a projectable number. And I also look at the type of game that I'm doing and then the metrics that are available. Uh, as much as data is expensive, it's not, because there's always one person who knows someone who can get you some rough approximations and a snapshot of data points. And that's how I do it. But yeah, there's the P&L that I can build for an investor and for an angel investor who doesn't know games. Yeah, you can get away with that. But I don't want to do business that way. Uh, there's a saying, uh, old saying, if you always tell the truth, you never have to remember what you say. And when you ask for money, it's much easier to just lay it out there. This is what we are. This is why we're good. This is what we're going to do. And this is what we expect the return to be. And most investors are looking at a return. They're looking at you and evaluating you as a business. Yeah, it helps if you're passionate, but there isn't anyone I know who makes games on any level who doesn't love games and doesn't love what they're making. So that's not a, that's not a discriminator. It doesn't make you unique. What makes you unique is for you to be able to convey the passion for what you want to do and explain that as a business, because investors invest in business entities. And in reality, as Sean said yesterday, and others have said, they will invest in you and your team. They want to know who you are. They want to know that if you say something, that you'll do something. And yeah, it's still a bet. That's why one out of 10 investments, hopefully, usually it's more than one out of 15, is really monetizably successful. But it still comes down to your ability to show that you did all this research, that you're going to take investors' money seriously, including some parents, sadly. Más <laughs> preguntas? Thank you. Um, uh, I have been uh, with uh, in your conference and the other with the other speakers. Uh, we talk a lot about metrics. And, uh, and iterations and testing. But um, for independent studios like us, I, I'm familiar with a few tools, and they're expensive. So with the budgets that we handle here in Colombia, which are even smaller than in the, in the States, uh, what kind of tools can we use? What, what, what could we find helpful for us in terms of uh, <coughs> beta testing and also with uh, measuring metrics? Well, I think metrics is the easier one to answer, so I'll do that. <laughs> so is everyone here familiar with Flurry? So Flurry is free, and you get value out of Flurry. You're giving something up because they're taking all that data and reselling it. Uh, there's a company called Planomics. So Planomics has uh, a new business model, and right now they have a much better dashboard and tool set it's no harder to work with their API than anyone else's. And it's completely free. And it has much more depth in terms of how you carve the numbers. But the important thing is, when you're looking at your analytics, is that you better have someone 
who's actually looking at the data. It's amazing how so many people look once a week and you need to be staring at that depending on your game and at what level you are within an audience three times a day, four times a day. So make sure that you have the overhead to cover the analytics if analytics are going to drive your game. And again, it depends on the type of game that you're, you're building. I'm not a proponent of everyone doing this for nothing and free to play. You know, there's plenty of examples, successful examples of games that are selling at $2, $1.99 at The Room, if those of you are familiar with the, the puzzle game, The Room 3D Puzzle, came out last year. Two guys, X Lionhead and Media Molecule, the team that did uh, you know, Little Big Planet. So they spent about 500,000 euros to get that game, plus they got some below the line help from uh, Sony, but be that as it may, they put that game out at $6.99. So it doesn't take a lot of installs to get your money back at $6.99. They were profitable in three days. They didn't buy any ads. They got their first promotion 10 days in, in the English store. They're still more of an outlier, but between $7.99, $6.99, and $1.99, there is a market for quality experiences. But the way free-to-play games it changes everything. You're not selling a product, you're selling a service. And service is ongoing. And so that's where the finances and being able to project things, you know, becomes important. And the analytics are, you know, give you an idea whether you're staying on the road or driving off a cliff. But I think that, you know, the opportunity is for, for some of the game pitches that I saw the last two days, there's some things there that I think are worth money. And again, you can test that. You can launch a game in a small market at $1.99 and see what happens. And if you don't get any traction in two or three days, pull it. But, you know, the design differences are there. And of course, the freemium model where you're charging some, you know, is a way to help hedge uh, the bet for your own revenues. And again, you should have a good idea. By the time you're ready to go, you know, put your binary up in the app store, load your APK file into Google, you should know whether you have, you have a game that people are going to want to play. And if you're not confident that people are going to want to play it, don't put it out there. Once you've launched, you've launched. And there's all these games that you know, people have gone around and consolidated, a game that was out for 24 months and hasn't done anything. For the cost of recoding, you might as well code fresh and put a, you know, a new idea in. Now, how many tic-tac-toe 3D games does the App Store need? So, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. And again, if you send an email to Joseph, it's a secret, I will send you a copy. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Joseph.